Good evening, everyone. I'm so happy that you're joining us this evening. We're thrilled to have Alessandra leading uh, this uh, in conjunction with our exhibition, The World of Frida. We're here at the California Company Arts Escondido in our beautiful museum, which we're so lucky um, to have such a great space and such a beautiful show uh, to fill it. So come on down. We're here until November 15th. Um, check our website. There's a couple free days. We have discounts for um, students and and first responders. So um, please inquire about that and come check us out. I want to uh, do a little introduction uh, for Alessandra before she starts. So um, a little bio background. Alessandra Moctezuma is gallery director and professor of art at San Diego Mesa College, where she leads the museum studies program courses on Chicano art. She earned uh, two degrees from UCLA, a Bachelor of Arts and a Master of Fine Arts in Painting and Printmaking. She is also um, a PhD candidate. She's all but her dissertation, Hispanic Languages and Literature at the State University in New York, Stony Brook. Teaching and curating, Ms. Moctezuma has been actively involved in the San Diego arts community. She is a board member of the Women's Museum of California, Medium Photography, of the Villa Moctezuma, and the San Diego Museum of Arts, Latin American Arts Council. Ms. Moctezuma has extensive experience as a curator, artist, and public arts administrator. Besides working as a gallery director at Mesa College, she has organized exhibitions for the Oceanside Museum of Art, uh, Borderless Dreams in 2005, through the lens sharply in 2006, as well as Undocumenta in 2017. And that was part of the Gettys Initiative Pacific Standard Time, um, LA, LA, and for the Museum of Latin American Art, Long Beach. We are honored and pleased to have Alessandra with us. Um, if you have any questions um, that you want uh, me to ask, Andra, please send them through the chat and we will uh, leave time for questions at the end. So without further ado, I present Alessandra. Take it away. Thank you so much, Beth. I'm so delighted to be here tonight this evening with everybody. Uh, it feels familiar because I teach on Zoom every week, three classes. So uh, seeing you in this format is uh, kind of familiar. And um, I'm talking to you from my living room, uh, my dining room actually. And uh, yeah, as you can see, I have my little Frida uh, lunchbox behind me. And um, I just went to see the exhibition last Sunday and it's stunning. And I really hope that you get a chance to go and visit. Uh, it's really wonderful and a wonderful way to support our local institutions. Um, so I was super excited to uh, be able to present on Frida Kahlo because one of the um, focuses of my work has been Mexican art and Chicano art. And also as a woman, Frida Kahlo is a, um, an inspiration for me. So I've prepared for you a slide uh, presentation and I have a lot of slides to show you. Uh, and I'm going to combine some works that are in the exhibition also with some images from Frida's um, artwork to make those connections between this, the two. Maybe I'll just hold on one second before I start until, since people are still coming in. Um, so do any, does anybody have any questions before we begin? Can you hear me okay and everything? Yes? Okay. All right. So I'm going to share my screen. And this takes me back, takes us back to our days uh, in our art history classes when we'd sit in the back and the instructor talks and, and we would fall asleep with the slides. No, don't fall asleep, please. <laughs> I hope that this will be interesting. Um, so I'm going to begin with an image from Chicano Park because I think that that's such an important historical site here in San Diego. And um, this is a mural that uh, has the three Tres Grandes, uh, Siqueiros, Orozco, and Rivera, 
But the central figure in this image is Frida Kahlo. And she is the one that is standing in full, you know, where we can see her in full view. And so that shows you a little bit about how important she was for Chicano artists already in the 1970s when this image was painted. Um, and this particular mural was actually inspired by a famous uh, print, which is in the exhibition in, um, in the California Center for the Arts. And it's one of the images that you see as you come into the exhibit. And this is a, um, a silk screen poster um, the one that is um, at, the, at the center is actually a woodcut based on the silk screen. And it's probably one of the most iconic uh, images of Frida that, um, you know, that Chicanos um, artists um, used to celebrate her. And I wanted to uh, bring this image as one of the first images that we look at because before Frida became such an important figure um, in mainstream, uh, she, she was discovered by Chicano artists. Um, and the other thing that I want to uh, bring up is that this uh, silk screen was done by artist Rupert Garcia. He's an artist in the Bay Area. And he was doing a series of um, silk screens that he was utilizing uh, to raise bail money for students that had been arrested in the anti-Vietnam War protests. And so, so this also shows the connection of um, the political intent and the struggle for social justice that was so key for Chicanos and their embracing of the figure of Frida, who was very much aligned with those ideas of being political, of, of being involved in making um, Mexico a better place and the world a better place and a very strong um, advocate for that. So, so this is kind of how I wanted to begin. And, um, just showing you that before Frida became well known in the mainstream, she was celebrated by Chicano artists. Um, Frida became probably the most popular after the release of the biography by Hayden Herrera, which was in 1983. Um, and I started um, college in 1988. And by that time, I, that, that book, was out and very popular. And that's also how I learned a lot of the history of Frida and immersed myself in the history of Frida. So this is just a biographical slide um, about Frida. We are so familiar with her eyebrows, with her um, beautiful, um, very uh, elegant, um, you know, uh, face and the way that she stands in front of the camera. She's very seductive in all of her self-portraits and also in the portraits that photographers took of her. Um, so this is, um, she was born in 1907, although she always changed her date of birth to 1910. Um, she wanted to be a child of the Mexican Revolution. Um, so uh, oftentimes she lied about her um, birthday. And in this case, it wasn't to make herself uh, younger. It was really because she wanted that symbolic uh, date to be when the date when she was born. Um, and she, she died fairly young in, in 1954. Um, and she um, was the wife of Diego Rivera. And, um, and she was very much a part of the Mexican Renaissance. So after the Mexican Revolution in the 1920s, the Mexican muralists were hired by the Mexican government to create murals all over the country. And they were redefining what it was to be Mexi Mexican. And so they were looking at Mexican history and finally incorporating the stories of the indigenous people, uh, pre-Columbian history um, into, into their images. They were also finally celebrating the farm workers and the workers and it was really a kind of decolonizing initiative. I guess that's what we would say right now, that they were looking at things not from the European perspective, which what was what had prevailed in the in previously, you know, and in the 19th century um, in Mexico, but they were really elaborating a new way of thinking of, of being Mexican as being a mestizo, but really elevating um, the indigenous. And so Frida becomes 
uh, an adult during this era. And so she also embraces all this. And I think she represents as a woman who dressed in beautiful uh, Mexican costumes and celebrated those and put them out there in the world for everybody to see. I think she was also so much of a representative of that um, new found, you know, Mexicanidad or, or how to be uh, Mexican, Mexicanness. Um, in, her, um, in her work, uh, Frida documents her experiences. Uh, she, throughout her life, paints a lot of self-portraits, and that's because that was the model that she had available. But in each one of those self-portraits, she brings in something slightly new and um, different to show and to share with the viewer. Uh, she also did a lot of works that were not self-portraits, and those are less known, and I'm going to share with you a few of those. Not as many as I would like, because I do want to make space for the artists that are in the exhibit, but I will touch upon some of those images. Um, another very important aspect of Frida's life was the fact that she suffered a major accident when she was very young, when she was in her late, late teens into adulthood, and that would really reshape her life. Uh, it would, um, it probably would have left her paralyzed, was it not because uh, for her will to, to walk again, uh, but it caused long lasting damage and some of her works deal with that. Um, so I'm gonna go and show you some images. So this is Frida, a painting that she did of her wedding day. And um, she's with Diego Rivera, of course, the, her husband. And this is a photograph um, of their wedding. Uh, her father was a photographer and, and this image is colorized. So it's kind of a lovely image of them together. And he kind of towers over her. Uh, her the mother said that he was like a dove, um, you know, marrying an elephant. So it was, you know, the, her parents were not very, very, her mother was not very happy. Uh, but here we see Frida and Diego and she chooses to dress not in the white, um, you know, Catholic, you know, dress of the, of the bride, but she chooses a very humble attire, you know, that's more connected to the, to the women of Mexico with her rebozo and uh, holding on to, to Diego. And Diego is the one that's represented as the painter and as the artist. And she's kind of like a supportive figure in this work. Um, this, uh, there are some ways that the artists in the exhibit comment on the relationship of Frida and Diego, and it was a very tumultuous relationship. Uh, they actually were married twice because they married, and then at some point Frida couldn't take it anymore, the fact that he was a womanizer and that he cheated on her. So she, they divorced, but then they got back together. And so they were, that shows that they were very connected. Their souls were connected, even, even if they couldn't, um, you know, Diego couldn't sustain, um, you know, a faithful relationship. Uh, but, but he was still a very important figure in her life. So I love this image that's by artist Anita Beshears. Uh, it's called Her Favorite Dogs. And, um, and what she's done is that she's painted uh, the, uh, Frida's um, Senor Xolotl. She is la, it's a Xolos Quincle, which is those hairless dogs from um, that originate in Mexico. And so she's painting uh, Senor Xolotl with the head of Diego Rivera. And so you could also reinterpret as a man being a dog because Rivera was not very nice to her, um, but still, you know, she, um, you know, she loved him and they stayed together. And he was maybe not faithful to her, but he was very loyal to her. So like a dog would be in a way. And, and he did help her and protect her, you know, until her death. Even though he was 20 years older, she actually died before he did. Um, so here we see Frida, and I, I really love how the artist was also inspired by many uh, paintings of Frida where the, um, the heart is connected through the where the veins, the arteries become uh, these red ribbons. And, and um, Diego's leash uh, is actually very much connected to Frida's um, heart 
And, and the other important element here is how her heart is also connected to her palate and her brush. So in the previous one, in the original image by Frida, it was Diego that is brandishing the palette and the brush. And in this one, Anita Bashir has given that um, to, um, to Frida because now we recognize her as a great painter. Um, the other thing is that this artist also brings into the piece the tradition of the calavera, which is so important in Mexican folk art. And Dia de los Muertos is coming up. And actually there's a beautiful Dia de los Muertos altar at, this, at the center. And so the image of the skeleton, the calavera, uh, there's famous images by engraver uh, from the 19th century into the uh, Posada, Jose Guadalupe Posada, who was, um, most, was very well known when Frida was uh, a child and a young person. So this artist takes on that image of the calavera and incorporates it into the piece. There's also some humorous pieces in the exhibition. And I, I really love this one. This, and, and this also shows you that the exhibit has works by artists from all over the world. So this is Laurina Paperina, and she's an Italian artist. Um, and she uh, has created this image of Diego and Frida. Maybe they're fighting. Um, and and um, Frida is saying bad boy, but she's maybe saying bad boy to the creature in the center. Uh, Frida painted a lot of um, monkeys into her um, self-portraits and they were her pets when she was young. Actually, my grandmother was, would have been about Frida's age, maybe a little bit younger. And my grandmother had a pet monkey when she was a kid in Mexico City. So I think that they were popular. But here you see that um, that happy family is not really that happy. And you have Frida the monkey uh, with Diego, maybe the monkey uh, represents some of those troubles and problems that they that, that they faced and they had. Um, the other uh, important paintings that where Frida incorporates uh, the image of Diego Rivera um, is like this one, Diego, on my mind. Um, in this one, she's dressed with a beautiful Tewana headdress with the um, lace and. Again, the, the lace that becomes kind of these tendrils that also make us think of nature and, you know, and flowers and, and also maybe um, spider webs. And, and you have Frida and on her forehead, she's painted an image of Diego, almost like he is part of her uh, third eye or, or the way that she sees the world, you know, kind of through him or she experiences the world through him. So that's um, another really interesting painting by Frida. And another artist, Barbara Johansson Newman, um, has taken that as a cue to create this shelf um, adorned with uh, roses. And then she's uh, recreated the portrait of Diego and, and Frida's very distinctive eyebrows, um, which are kind of shaped like a bird, like a swallow. Um, Here's a Frida with her pets, and, um, and she is the most famous because of her self-portrait. So that's what we always see um, represented in many exhibitions. That's what we see more commercialized also. So, um, so Frida is, like I mentioned before, she's a very seductive. Um, she's always facing us and um, her gaze is very intense. Um, she adds different types of symbols when she paints herself. So in this one, she has a necklace that is made out of thorns. So very much connected to uh, some ideas related to Christianity, Catholicism, and some of the imagery uh, of the saints and of Christ. And, and this reflects in, in the sacrifice that she makes um, as a woman, you know, as a uh, wife. Uh, but also some of the other personal sacrifices that she has to make because of her um, prob health problems. Um, and so, so we are familiar with this image of Frida and we've also seen a lot of the photographs of Frida. So she becomes a, a, um, a muse for a lot of photographers. Wherever she goes, people want to take her picture. Um, so Frida came and lived in the United States 
for several years while Diego Rivera was working in murals in San Francisco. He painted some murals for the Pacific Stock Exchange. He was also hired um, by Henry Ford um, that was in Detroit. Um, the murals are in the Detroit Art Institute. And, and then he also spent time in New York uh, where Diego painted the murals at the Rockefeller Center that were subsequently um, destroyed because of their political message. Uh, but that means that Frida spent quite a bit of time of her, of here in the United States and she hated it. She speaks very strongly about that in her um, diary. And she also has a painting, a couple of paintings where she, I don't have them here, but where she has, for example, the US represented as a toilet in her painting. Um, but this, but while she was here, she became a model, you know, she sat in for a lot of photographers that she befriended. And probably one of the most famous images, the one that actually the museum is using for some of the advertising for this exhibition is the photograph that Nicholas Murray took in New York and where she's sitting on a pretty ornate yeah, uh, white bench, and um, and she has that beautiful background that you know reminds us of of a garden and of nature. And then she's part of the garden with the flowers on her hair, and she's dressed with a beautiful wipil and a skirt with the embroidery and with a, a gold uh, necklace. Um, and and so and Frida was very um, in, interested in presenting this very feminine. Um, in some of her paint, paintings, uh, you'll see in others that she actually will dress as a man, but she always had you know, her, her nails painted red, she always had lipstick on, she always had her, her hair beautifully braided. And, um, and so this also speaks a lot about a kind of performative element to who she was. And, and that was definitely as much part of her art as I believe her paintings, that the way that she presented herself to the world, um, celebrating that Mexicanness, uh, celebrating those those traditions of textiles and embroidery, were very much uh, something that she wanted to bring to the world at large, and and so so many artists have adopted and appropriated this kind of performative aspect of her work. Uh, and created images that are that are appropriating, but also giving new meaning. Um, and so this is um, and, and there's several artists in the exhibition that place themselves in um, as if they were Frida. Um, and this is Emilio Lopez Mencher, uh, Menchero of uh, Brussels, Belgium, um, trying to be Frida. And so he's an artist that inhabits. Uh, different artists and different characters in his work. And, and this also talks a lot about, you know, gender fluidity, which is also something that Frida would experiment with uh, dressing up as, uh, as a man. And so now this, we have the counterpoint with this artist, um, you know, dressing up as, as Frida. And, and another artist, Razan El Baba, she's uh, an artist who is Muslim. So she's thinking also of herself and, and being a woman and how Frida also speaks to her. And, and here she's, you know, rather than having the, the braided hair, she's covered her hair with a, with a hijab, um, but she's um, staring at us and, and confronting us with the same power as, um, as Frida. So, so that's also talking a little bit about commentary on, on her religion and how she's presenting herself as a woman who is, um, you know, strong and, and obviously, you know, as a young photographer. Um, and then this is an artist from Japan, Atsuko Morita, and she um, has set herself up with a background with the flowers. And, and she's also somebody who admires Frida. And there's many other artists, you know, some very well-known artists, um, in Japan, there's other works by art, of artists uh, from China. Uh, Frida was also well known, not only for, mostly she dressed up with her Mexican costumes, but she also collected a lot of uh, Chinese uh, traditional uh, robes and 
embroidered um, shoes. And so, so she um, admired and she, um, and that, that whole collection is actually, I believe the San Francisco Museum of Art is gonna have a virtual exhibition coming up at the end of this month with all of her, her costumes. And, and so this also means that she had that connection to women from all over the world because all of this work is generally done by women. And here you have a Japanese artist that is connecting with that too. Frida um, also embraced the um, indigenous, the um, you know Aztec myths, um, and uh, and Frida and Diego collected pre-Columbian art. In fact, there's a museum that Diego Rivera set up before he died that you can visit, where they have the collection of their pre-Columbian artifacts. And here she is with a small Olmec idol that she's holding. Um, but some work maybe that's least known of, of Frida's is not shown as much is this one um, where she presents herself as a baby being nursed by a, an indigenous woman. And we don't see her face, but she's wearing this um, Olmec mask. And, um, and here Frida is emphasizing the nurturing that she got probably from a nanny that raised her. Uh, there's a lot of um, stories uh, in literature. Recently, um, the film uh, that Roma, you know, that took place in Mexico about um, people being raised by their nannies who are indigenous. And, and many artists have said that that's how they've connected with um, that part of Mexican culture. And, and so what I also love about this image is that Frida also brings in the idea of nature and the idea of, of the myths of uh, um, the gods and the Aztecs gods and the elements. So the rain kind of becomes the milk. So, so you can think of the goddess of fertility, Kwatlikwe, uh, Koyolshaki, and how they are in a way embedded in this image too. This is another painting by Frida that is also maybe less known, but this is called My Birth. And she had a very complex related relationship with her mother. So it's kind of interesting to contrast Frida with her nurse, you know, who is indigenous, who she uh, depicts as almost like a Madonna figure, you know, nursing her. And then the image of Frida's own mother or in her own birth, whose face is covered. Uh, because she really, um, you know, talked a lot in her journal about feeling somewhat abandoned by her mother. She was much close, much more close to her father. Here we see Frida in the middle of her um, garden in Coyoacan, in her Casa Azul, the blue house you can visit. It's her museum. And, and you see her parents, and you see again the mother towering over the father. So you see who wore the pants in that family. And, and then you see above the, the parents, the Hungarian Jewish parents and her mestizo parents, uh, grandparents. And then you see the mother with the, with the fetus. And then over here, you see the moment of conception. So uh, there's a lot of reference in Frida's work to uh, science and the human body and nature. And initially she wanted to, she aspired to be a doctor, but after her accident, um, you know, that, never came to, to pass. So she focused then later on her painting. But that's why there's a lot of images in her work that have, where she has this, this presents this knowledge of medicine and anatomy. Um, and then this is another image that relates to, um, to one of the paintings in the exhibition is a Frida at the hospital um, when they lived in Detroit after her miscarriage. And, um, and so she um, presents herself vulnerable in this barren landscape. Uh, again, you know, this idea of the red ribbon, um, the blood, her arteries connecting to her, um, you know, her organs, to her pelvis, which was broken in her accident when she was young, and the fetus of, you know, her, her baby who, who died. Um, and this, this, paint, this image is not in the exhibition, but I wanted to include it um, because I feel that artists 
sometimes are trying to give Frida what she never had in life. And they're trying to address that pain and that loss and, um, and kind of give back to her. And so this is Irena Cervantes painted in 1978. So again, you know, an artist who's a Chicana artist and you have Frida riding a Jaguar and Frida pregnant with her twins. And, um, and so, and then Diego over here as a toad. Um, so you see, uh, finally, Frida being uh, vindicated and, and able to, um, to bear children. And, and there's a, a painting in the exhibition by Crystal Moody that has that same um, intention in it, which is, you know, giving back to Frida, the, the child that she never had. And in this one, um, the, you see that the child is growing out of uh, Frida's um, heart. It's actually a more abstracted but, but lovely painting in the gallery. The other thing that I wanted to highlight um, is that Frida was very political. Uh, we look at all these beautiful, you know, portraits of Frida with the flowers, and she seems so feminine and almost like in some images, very delicate, but she was very strong and she was a member of the Communist Party with Diego Rivera and with uh, Siqueiros. And, and she participated in a lot of the protests. So she marched along the workers and the artists, and she was very much um, a member of that milieu in Mexico of leftist intellectuals. And in fact, Diego Rivera and Frida hosted Trotsky after he was, you know, had to, um, he fled the Soviet Union um, because of Stalin's persecution and he ended up in Mexico. Mexico is the only country that gave him asylum. And he, um, he stayed at Frida and Diego's house, actually, you know, was assassinated in Mexico City and Frida was his lover. And so I wanted to bring that aspect of her life too, because that's not something that may, probably a lot of people know that you are really, if you're celebrating Frida, you're celebrating a communist. I think that would scandalize the administration, you know, our current administration, but it's, uh, but that's very much uh, a reality. And the, here she is marching uh, with um, the syndicate or the union of painters and sculptors in, uh, in Mexico City. And you see Frida standing here. One of the few times where she's not dressed as a, in, in her beautiful, you know, attire, she's dressed more practical. Uh, and then here she is standing next to Diego Rivera. And, and Diego Rivera celebrated that part of Frida. So he included her in some of his murals. Here we have Frida actually handing out the rifles um, as a representation of a socialist or a communist revolution. And you see the hammer and the sickle and the flag and the uh, tierra y libertad or land and liberty in the background. And, and Frida is right in the center and a focal point as a woman. And, and of course, this would have connected with, to the fact that um, many women also fought in the Mexican Revolution. And so there's, there's a few artists here in the exhibit that celebrate and make that connection with the political involvement and the activism of Frida. And, and one of my favorite images is by Netzanet uh, Tesfaye. And she, um, she has this beautiful uh, print that is um, of Frida wearing a, a pussy hat. And so we could imagine that if Frida was alive today, she would have probably gone to the Women's March or she would have been out in the Black Lives Matter marches. And, and so I think that it's very important not to forget that about Frida because otherwise we're just looking at the superficial, you know, with ways, the way that she looked, but we're not really seeing the, um, you know, the person. Uh, and actually at the cen cen center, you also see a letter uh, from Trotsky that was written to, um, to Frida uh, in the exhibition. And so this is another image where Frida, uh, uh, towards the end of her life, so she, this is the year she died, 1954, she paints herself standing with her idols. And so here you have Marx right behind her. And so, so somebody who's 
an atheist and probably you know didn't believe in heaven, but she still wanted to surround herself herself with um, with the people who had guided her. And an artist, Pete Rodriguez, presents Frida as the soldadera, um, the women who fought in the Mexican Revolution, who not only uh, were taking care of the men, but when their husbands or their boyfriends or their sons died, actually took on their rifles and continued um, you know, to, to fight on um, alongside the men. Um, another, um, another part of Frida is that she was a very much against the grain. Uh, at that time, she, um, she wanted to stand up as a woman. Uh, she wanted to be independent. Um, she didn't want to just follow the, um, you know, the traditional role of a woman as a wife, as, uh, you know, um, somebody who was subservient or somebody who was not um, working or that's why she always wanted to have a career. She wanted to be a painter. And so here, this, here's a photograph of Frida, probably around 19 year, years old, maybe right before the accident. And she's standing with the rest of her family and her family seems like they're just barely tolerating her. They don't seem very happy here. But she is um, already staring down at the camera and wearing a full, um, you know, man's uh, suit, and um, and you can imagine how scandalous that would have been at the time. Um, but later on in her paintings, she uses that idea of the suit as also uh, another symbol of a moment in her life where she um, needed to be strong and she need, really needed to be resilient. Um, and so this is a painting that she made uh, right after she divorced um, Diego. And she was living by herself and she decided to cut off her hair um, because that was one of the reasons that Diego loved her. You know, this idea of that the woman has to be very feminine and you have to have long hair and you have to take care of it. Uh, and so she incorporated uh, the lyrics of a song above, look if he loves you, it was for your hair, and now that you're bald, he, he no longer loves you. Um, but she's kind of embracing that and being, um, you know, very, um, you, you know, challenge, challenging, you know, those notions. Uh, the other th interesting thing about this image is that she, as, in contrast with the previous photograph where she's wearing this suit that fits her very well, you notice that this suit is very baggy. So she's actually wearing one of uh, Diego Rivera's suits. And so she's inhabiting him. You know, she's kind of taking over. And she's, um, that's what kind of she has left of him when she leaves him, is his suit. Uh, but the other very interesting thing besides the barren lands life landscape, which represents loneliness and is that she is holding the scissors in a very strategic place. So she's almost like castrating. So remember that one of the reasons that she left Diego was because he was a womanizer. So she's holding the scissors in a very um, important spot. And I think that's the way that she's kind of getting back at him. Um, so an artist in the exhibition has also taken this as um, inspiration. And this is an artist from Arizona. She um, actually uh, titles this piece F. Kahlo. And she uh, was using makeup um, and posing as different famous artists. This is a project that she did um, throughout her year as a student. Uh, but she, um, she does a really wonderful job, I think, in, in bringing in that kind of performative aspect into this piece and photographing herself uh, on this chair in the middle of this room uh, in, the, in the same um, posture um, as, um, as Frida. And then the other artist um, that I found, uh, whose work I found really interesting is um, Monica Balmelli, because she creates a small shrine to Frida and these boxes or cajitas or shrines are very much part of Mexican folk art. 
Um, and she represents Frida. It's almost like a cajita for the Dia de Muertos, uh, a miniature altar. Actually, my students are doing their altars as a project. You see the skeletons here. And, um, but she also paints Frida with uh, pink hair. And, and this is where I want to mention that, that the, Frida became such an important icon for women, for Chicanos, for feminists. But she's also, she's also been embraced by um, artists who are um, queer and, and as a representative of that kind of aesthetic. Um, here's um, a painting by Marco Terenciano. And so the, the Frida cross-dressing again, uh, Frida wearing a jacket, looking very tough. Uh, it's almost like she's gonna you know, get on her motorcycle. Um, but she still has Diego, you know, a little picture of Diego peeks out from her pants and then um, her pets um, surround her. So I thought this was a really beautiful kind of contemporary uh, representation or depiction of Frida. This is probably one of the largest paintings that um, Frida did. It's uh, the Las Dos Fridas and here she is in front of it. You see that it's almost uh, life size. Um, and here's the painting. And again, here she is showing two sides of herself, the indigenous side and the side that is the bride, the more European, and one is, is feeding on the other. So the indigenous side is actually providing and nurturing the, um, you know, the more feminine Frida. Uh, this was taken by, uh, by two artists as, um, as an image that they uh, recreated. And these are two artists who are paralyzed. Um, and one of them is actually a painter, paints with her mouth. Uh, and then they were joined by a photographer who uh, has um, scoliosis and muscular dystrophy and who took their picture. And so, so in this sense, you also see that Frida also becomes such an important um, example and inspiration for um, some artists that have, are facing uh, different um, disabilities and, um, and her strength and her perseverance throughout her life. Frida was also um, very open uh, about being bisexual. And this is one of the paintings where she shows uh, two women, one indigenous and one looking more mestiza. Um, and so that's, you know, another element in her work uh, of the, the part of her sexuality that's also important in her work that, um, you know, that you will also see in the, in the exhibition too, some artists dealing with some of that. Um, because I'm getting, I think, close to the hour, I just wanted to go more quickly through these images. So this is a sketch um, that Frida made of her accident, uh, the trolley that collided with a bus when she was riding and left her paralyzed, broke her pelvis, broke her, her spine, uh, basically, um, you know, the, destroyed her uterus also. That's why she had a lot of problems having a child. And, and so she paints herself as a wounded deer in, in many of her images. Uh, as, and I think this is not just about her physical pain, but it's also about the emotional pain as uh, Diego Rivera's wife. And she, she's, a famous quote is that one of her accidents was the, the bus colliding, but her other accident was marrying Diego. And so this relates a lot to the idea of kind of the sacrifice that she made and, and being uh, fragile and being vulnerable. And some artists in the exhibition bring that to bear uh, and delve into that. So this is Francisco Franco and, and, and basically takes that image, prior image. And, and in this one, Frida is still, you know, kind of upright are running along, you know, but wounded. And in this one is more like a memento mori, a kind of reminder of, of her mortality. And, and it's, it's a little bit sadder as a, an image. Um, 
but you also have this other one that is a colorful kind of celebration with uh, the image of San Sebastian in the back from a Catholic you know, painting. He's represented with the arrows, so there's that connection. An image of a centaur with a skeleton head. Uh, and then I want to show you my interpretation of uh, Frida, which comes very much from a feminist standpoint of not Frida as the wounded deer, but Frida coming back to hunt the hunter. So in this one, I painted Frida and my style is very different. You know, it's much more loose and um, much more conceptual, but I painted uh, Frida as a kind of satyr as opposed to a, a deer and she's come back and she has her bow and arrow and she's shooting at this iconic image of uh, of a geisha, which to me represents this idea of the objectified woman. And then she's also standing on a Mexican, you know, sombrero that is, is twirling, you know, at a fast speed. So she's already being able to juggle all these things. And I give her back the power that I feel that, you know, she, she required. And then I just inserted in here another uh, series of self-portraits because I was inspired by Frida and the idea of the self-portrait as an, as, as an artist, you know, I paint a lot of self-portraits. It is very easy to just sit in front and mine, you know, are done very quickly. I give myself just 20 minutes, 30 minutes to do a self-portrait and they're done in marker. But these are self-portraits that are also symbolic. I'm utilizing, you know, domestic implements like she did, utilize symbols you know, a, a hanger, no wire hangers, you know, thinking about our right, reproductive rights, you know, a woman with a, a muscle, you know, a colander that serves as a muscle, you know, for women, women being quieted down. And then I hear another woman that is also holding the lid of a pan and almost decapitating. And so, so I, I have some of that, you know, anger, I guess, and that political, um, intent in beside my work um, that that I bring into my self portraits and, and I definitely was inspired by Frida's work in, in doing this. Um, so lastly, I'm going to end with some images that were done later in her life where she was um, bedridden and having a harder time with her um, mobility. Uh, she had several surgeries but she still found ways to tap into that other part of herself that was strong and that was resilient. And that's seen in this image, the Frida. You remember the last dos Fridas? Well, this one are also two Fridas, you know, one Frida that's um, basically in, um, you know, in the hospital and then one Frida that's holding her brace, that's kind of holding her up. Um, towards the end of her life, uh, Frida, actually, one of her um, legs, her foot got gangrene, and so she, um, they had to amputate her foot, and so that was very traumatic. And uh, artist Mandy Behrens deals with that in this lovely uh, work where she recreates the, the boot that Frida used after um, her amputation, and, and it was adorned and it was another way of Frida kind of dealing with that loss to make that boot look beautiful and to adorn it and to have it embroidered and to have this, these bells that would jingle as she walked. Um, and so she had that, that put, put in that perspective of, you know, um, overcoming um, those challenges. And then this is another um, brace that a corset that she wore and there's a famous photograph of her you know wearing this corset where she um she paints it with the hammer and the sickle and the red star um because towards the end of her life she's really embracing uh, almost in a in a you know in a religious way she's embracing you know her communist idols and she has she surrounds herself with images of trotsky and stalin and marx in her dead bath dead bed. And so, um, and then here, um, an artist takes that same corset and makes it a miniature out of cut paper and also makes a little shrine uh, to represent the trauma of her life 
but also to represent what you know held her together um, and what you know comforted her. Another image of Frida, this one um, famous one. She's exposed with with her spine as this column. An artist, Patty Goldstein, creates this doll. So the kind of opposite of something that's kind of sturdy and strong is a raggedy ant doll that is transformed into this Frida. Again, the skeleton face. Um, there's two sides to this image. And, and, and you know, the idea of Frida's communion with her mortality and her, you know, uh, acceptance of the fact that her life you know, was not going to be that long, you know, that it was going to be cut short. Um, so here is Frida in the dream. And, and she and Diego collected the, the Judas, the large uh, paper mache effigies that are burned in the, in the fairs in Mexico. Uh, and she is not a, doesn't seem to be afraid. She seems to be comfortable, you know, rising up to the heavens in her bed and surrounded, you know, by a nice, you know, blanket and her pillows and um, beautiful vines that um, also envelop her. Um, as there's an artist, Jamie Burnside, who has this also these two sides of Frida, you know, her life, but also Frida confronting her her death and and she again. He again uses the, the deer, you know, the, the antlers of the deer, the moon that's rising, you know, the moon as a powerful symbol of femininity and, and, uh, and power. Um, and then we have um, the image by Frida, which I think also relates to some of the works by some of the Mexican muralists who had the people who had died, the um, people who had died during the revolution, the Mexican revolution, they often painted them as becoming the fertilizer and being buried and being the seeds, becoming the seeds for the next generation. And so um, a powerful kind of positive and hopeful message um, that um, they, they wanted to paint, but that Frida also takes in this image where, where she becomes part of the landscape and she becomes part of the earth. And, um, and she becomes part of the land. And then this is the, the last image that I think relates to that idea of hopefulness and of Frida, you know, as a butterfly kind of reborn, but also, you know, the idea of also life as, as being very fragile and life as being very ephemeral. Um, our artist Amanda Ling Gracier celebrates her and, and how she's become kind of this, this mother figure for a lot of artists and for a lot of, you know, women and for a lot of Latinas. And so this is the last image, the one that I want to end with. So that's, that's it. Thank you so much, Alessandra. Oh, that was wonderful. I really sort of lost myself in your lecture and could listen to you for many, many more hours, I think. It's fascinating. We had a lot of great questions and we had a great turnout. So thank you to all the people um, that joined us this evening. Um, we are happy to present this uh, lecture for free. If you have the ability to donate, please do. Um, there's a couple different avenues um, on our website or you could simply text Frida to 44321 um, and give us a small donation. Um, we would love that. So again, that's Frida, F-R-I-D-A. You text Frida to 44321. Um, okay, so we got the great questions. Um, I wanted to ask, so very few artists are so well known and even fewer are women. What do you think is so captivating about Frida? Well, I think it's because Frida, first of all, I, just her paintings are so gorgeously seductive and, and she just did such a great job at capturing her intensity and her passion. And, and I also think that all of the symbols that she adds, whether it's her dresses uh, and how they celebrate Mexican culture 
Um, but I think also a lot of the symbolism in her work relates so much to some of the struggles and the challenges that we face as women, that we face, you know, as um, being Mexican uh, or being Latino, or like I said, being, um, having, uh, being an outsider. I think that's, that's one of the reasons that we gravitate towards her. Uh, and, and as I mentioned throughout the lecture, I tried to give examples on how she is become um, adored by all of the different groups, whether you're a feminist or whether you are Chicano or whether you are queer and how all of, everybody finds a way to connect, that, that she connects with them in a very intense manner. Uh, personally, more than even her self-portraits, I really gravitate towards those paintings that are more narrative about her life and her struggle and that to me encapsulate um, some of the ways that, that we can rise up and, and kind of stand up and critique the, the, our norms and, um, and become more active in, in, in trying to counter those things that limit us. Absolutely. Um, okay, and then this is another question from someone um, out there in our audience. Uh, they asked, did Frida design her own clothes herself? These are usually not clothes that, that she designed. These are actual traditional clothes that are um, part of, you know, Mexican, you know, culture and tradition. So it's like I'm wearing a traditional huipil. So, so I think that most of the clothes that she, purchased, that she purchased or acquired were actual items that women had created in the different towns and villages. And, 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 and so she was able to find them and purchase them and preserve them. She didn't so much design her clothes, but she designed her look. She just, she put things together. Um, so she found the right accessories and the right way to, to do her hair. But if you go to Mexico now, you will see a lot of those similar huipiles with the, the same type of embroideries and uh, details that you will see in some of her paintings. It seems like she really developed a fashion style that was her own that now is replicated many, many times over. We're so lucky in this exhibition to have a local collector that owned some of her personal things. And so on display, along with the rest of the exhibition, we have a blouse of hers and a necklace um, and some other personal items. So those are really great to see. Um, and, and also to uh, just to show how important these items were to her and how much they were just much more than just clothes, you know, they were part of her persona. So she actually, when, when, she, when Diego died, they put her clothes, even though the museum opened with a lot of the items, they actually put her clothes in a vault or they put them away. And they said that those couldn't be on view for 50 years. So that, that those 50 years uh, just passed. And, and so that was a, a big, you know, um, discovery to bring out all of her items and all of her clothes. And there's being an exhibition that is traveling of her clothes and her items. And there's a beautiful catalog uh, that has been published of her clothes. I had heard somewhere that after she passed away, it was Diego that originally wanted certain things locked yes. away. Yes, and exactly. And then, wow, that's so fascinating. So we're still getting to explore and enjoy new things about her, which is really fun. Um, this question also came from someone who was um, joined us tonight. Um, they asked, was Frida influenced by other female painters of her time, such as uh, Georgia O'Keeffe? Frida was living in Mexico, so um, she was definitely a part of a group of artists in Mexico that we're gravitating towards surrealism. Uh, I'm, I'm, I, I can't, I'm not so sure about George O'Keefe, so I don't want to say something I don't know. So I should research that. But, I, but she um, definitely was influenced by surrealism. And there were many women in that movement that ended up in Mexico. Uh, the two most famous ones were Remedios Varo and Leonora Carrington. And, and of course, Andre Breton really admired uh, Frida. Um, and Frida was the, the one friendship that I know that was important to her was Tina Modotti, who was, became a photographer in Mexico. She was actually Italian-American, 
moved to Mexico and became best friends with Frida. And so together they did a lot of political work. And, um, and so that was important. But off, right now I don't, I know she didn't like the US. I don't remember like George O'Keefe, you know, as part of her, her group, but I should, I should delve in, research that. That's a good question. It is a good question. You know, one of the items that I mentioned, the collector, the local collector that owned uh, pieces and they loaned them to us, one of the items is a phone book. And so uh, he pointed out uh, Siqueiros' phone number and uh, Manuel Alvarez Bravo, the photographer's uh, phone number in her phone book, along with a slew of doctors and, and other neighbors and friends and names we don't recognize. So uh, we should take a look again through her phone book and really see who she was in contact with. I think that would be great. So we have um, another question. Did Frida face any backlash while she was alive regarding the bold subject matter that she chose to paint? No, because she, she struggled to be known as a painter during her life. So she only had a, a solo show in Mexico right before she died. And, um, and she had another show, of an exhibition in France that Andre Breton organized for her. Um, but, but Frida, when I grew up, I mean, I'm the daughter of, a, my father was a friends with painters, was a painter. When I was a child, nobody talked about Frida or her work. She just, she basically just started to become popular, I would say really in the eighties, you know, really after the Chicano artists kind of discover her, she was just seen as kind of a minor painter. So I don't think she, there was a lot of backlash because she really didn't have that kind of audience. And, and I think the most insulting thing is that if you look at some of the newspapers of the time, there's one article when she was in New York with Diego and she was painting and, and, and a journalist said, and here's a picture of Frida, she dabbles in painting. Yeah, that's not good. <laughs> um, okay, and then this is another great question. It says, regarding the deer images, what do the antlers suggest um, within the vulnerability of the deer? Well, I don't, I think the, the answers are, are the one part of the deer that represents, you know, the fighting spirit and, and the potential of, you know, defending themselves. So, so I think that's, a, a, that's one of the, the reasons that I, you know, some of the artists, I think, emphasize the, the deer antlers in the skeleton. So, so, so that's, you know, so I think a deer, yes, it's usually seen as docile, but but, you know, they can also defend themselves. And that's why I gave my painting a little bit of a different take on that. I love that. Um, so uh, why do you think so many uh, romanticize Frida and Diego's relationship when it was so tumultuous? Uh, do you think Frida would feel repelled by this obsession to always be connected with Diego? And this, there's an impression that they had this great love affair, uh, which I suppose they had a great friendship. <laughs> Yes, I think that they had a, an, a great connection. And I think, you know, you never know with people, you know, people and their relationships. And I remember that when I was young and I first read her biography, I would get really upset. And I said, if my boyfriend was cheating on me or my husband, I would like divorce them. I couldn't like stand it. But they, you know, I think there was something more to their relationship than a sexual relationship. And when they remarried the second time, they kind of agreed not to have a sexual relationship anymore. It was gonna be, I think it's more than a friendship. It's just like they had an affinity. I think they had political values and ideals that they shared. And, and then they each had their partners. So in a way it was a kind of very, in a way, very modern way to look at, at love. I, I, I think the problem was that she loved him too much you know, and that she suffered a lot until she got to that point where she could kind of separate herself from the emotional and, and, and the more sexual relationship. And, and, she could and she could enjoy her own uh, affairs with women and men. And she found happiness in that. She, she was also a lover of Isamu Noguchi. She was a lover of Trotsky. You know, she had a lot of really amazing, um, lovers that were in, you know, interesting and intellectual. So I think it's complex. I think it's kind of hard to, I don't think she would mind that in a way she's become more famous than Diego. 
So I think she, I think if, she, if anything, she might be upset on the way that she's been commercialized. Mm, yeah, definitely. I think we have time for maybe one more. Um, and this is a great question. Um, what do you think Frida would uh, feel about the shape that her legacy has taken? Uh, you just mentioned maybe she wouldn't like the commercialism so much. Um, but do you think she would appreciate all of the popularity and, um, you know, people that, you know, wear their eyebrows like her or wear their flower crowns? I think that she would love the way that she inspires, you know, other artists. And, and uh, when people go see the exhibition, they will see all the different facets, you know, that these artists are navigating in the work. And people might not know, but Frida was a professor of art. So she taught at the academy in Mexico, in Mexico City, and she had a group of students that she called Los Fridos. And, and they even painted murals in some of the pulquerias. So, so she also was more connected to the people. She, you know, it was not so much about painting like a, an epic mural. It was, let's go paint a mural in the pulqueria. You know, in the, in a pulqueria is, is like a, a bar, you know, where they drink a, a famous drink. So I think that the way that she inspires uh, so many artists and the, the way that she's become um, an example and an inspiration, you know, for yeah. so many. I think she probably would love that. And maybe she would get that kick of people like dressing up and doing the eyebrows. I think she had a sense of fear. One of my students was saying that she seemed to have suffered a lot in her life and didn't have a lot of joy. But if you read her biography, it's the opposite. You know, if you read her journal, she had a a, a really great sense of humor. She didn't feel sorry for herself at all. You know, she was a lot of fun. So maybe she would kind of get a kick out of it. I love it. That's great. Well, thank you so much, Alessandra. This was a wonderful lecture. Thank you to all the people that joined us this evening. We did record it. Uh, so we will post it up on our website if you want to share it. Um, with a friend or watch it again, we would love that. So again, we'd love any support that you can give. If you want to text Frida to 44321, come on down to the California Center for the Arts and come see our exhibition. Uh, we're here through November 15th. We have a great um, small event on Wine Wednesday, keeping everyone socially distanced and um, enjoying some time outside on our courtyard patio. Um, and seeing the exhibition as well. So I wanna thank you again and thank everyone for joining us. Bravo, thank you. Thank you so much for inviting me. And, and yes, please go, go see the exhibition and, and go support. And it's one of the most beautiful spaces I think in, in San Diego and, and you always do a, a great job in putting together just fantastic exhibitions. So go see the exhibits, but even become a member so that you can support the organization. Thank you for saying that. We appreciate it. And we thank you again so much. Have a good evening, everyone. Stay safe and come visit us. Have a good night. Thank you.